David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Good to be here. David, you know, we're in a time where there's a huge employee crunch at the moment, right? Everyone's trying to get employees. People are changing businesses all the time. With that being said, some of these employees have information on their computers. Mm -hmm. Some of these computers are inside their homes. What is going on in your world to try to help companies maintain some of this information for themselves and not having a competitor steal all their information? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one of the big things really is uh, your ability to maintain control over your intellectual property as an employer. And, you know, one of the big mistakes that people made, especially with the time of COVID, is they allow people to just work from home using their home computers. Um, you know, once you do that, you are giving up a lot of the control and influence you might have into what's happening with your, with your, with your intellectual property. When they start downloading their personal computers, they start accessing with their personal computers, then, you know, you, you almost lose all control. It's, and it's really bad because, uh, you know, in my line of work, in the 20 years I've been doing this, the ability to understand and know what an employee does with your intellectual property, especially, you know, in the, in the, in the day and a half or the week before they, they hand the resignation in because they're going to another, another company, you want to know if they've been copying off your intellectual property uh, or not. And uh, that's, that's really key. Yeah, we were talking about this offline, that there was actually a situation where there was an attempt of intellectual, intellectual property theft that you did some maneuvering to prevent that. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Well, yeah, so, so uh, actually this is, you know, this is a, a case I'm working on right now. I'm just, you know, and it's a, a client who has a uh, high ranking executive that they are concerned is going to leave. This person has been, been acting a little strange. And so, uh, they're, but they were still employed by the company. And so um, they want to come in and do some forensics on the computer and look at what's, what, what's been going on. And one of the things I told him, I said, well, look, this, this, this person is still an employee and they're still using their work computer. And your policy uh, uh, makes it clear that this is uh, work property and there's no expectation of privacy. And so what I recommended was that we install what I call keystroke monitoring software, computer surveillance software, basically on that work device. Um, and, and, and that that software is a tool we have, which records and documents every uh, website they go to, every document they print, every document they copy off to a USB drive or, 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 some, or, or something or some other device, um, every, every uh, website they go to, every email they read, including personal email, because they're reading them on company equipment, right? So we're able to capture all that. It even captures a, a picture of what's on the screen of the computer every 30 seconds. So we have like time-lapse movie, basically, of what this employee is doing at work, whether they're working or not, whether they're goofing off or not. Or in this case, when this employee took a Dropbox account that, that they had registered, they had registered it with the work address and, 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 and claimed that, well, I'm, doing, I'm using it for work purposes. Uh, well, you know, this employee uh, went in one morning and re-registered it from the work address to their personal email address. And then proceeded to highlight thousands of documents on the work computer and drag them and drop them into Dropbox after they changed the registration to their personal account. I have a screenshot that shows the Dropbox page, and with the, underneath it is a progress bar in that screenshot that says 11,592 files to go five more hours to synchronize. Wow. I Love mean, red-handed. Right, exactly. And I think that's exactly right that we're talking about. The underlying foundation of this was the fact that there was a clear cut policy that the person understood that there's no right of privacy, even though this particular item is inside your own home. But it, if you make it as clear cut as that, not saying it won't be litigation, but that's as good as you're going to get it. And it's pretty much the same expectation of privacy as you would have on your something on your desk at work, right? Yep. You don't have an expectation of privacy because you don't own that desk. That's not your piece of property. That is the company's property spelled up. But I think you're right though, because when this whole thing was starting, people's policies really weren't that clear. I yeah. don't really know because that wasn't a scenario that was covered. Exactly. No, it was, you know, uh, it, it, everybody's kind of, I mean, it was, it was crazy. I mean, the, the, the month or so around lockdown where people realized they were going to have to send all their employees to, the, to home, uh, work from home. I mean, it was essentially companies just opening up the doors 
to, to their to their environment, right? So that people could work right. from home. I mean, it's no different than they just open up the, all the doors and windows to the office building, you know, overnight and say, okay, people come in and come in and leave as you want. I mean, that's basically what happened, and that's why you know you have this issue with the employees. But that's also why the hackers and the ransomware and the data breach uh, uh, issues that we've been experiencing this last year and a half they just skyrocketed because all these companies threw open the doors without putting in, without having time to put in the infrastructure security pro, uh, uh, processes and procedures that they need to secure that data. Um, you know, it, it was, it, it's crazy time and people need to do what they needed to do to keep, to keep the business up and running, but there's a lot of risks that were being introduced into the environment that, that they're still working through right now. Um, David, th- thanks for bringing that because that's the other thing I want to talk to you about. So tell us how you help companies deal with ransomware, extortionware. Like what are the things that CLA does to ensure the safety of these companies? Yeah, I mean, so, so you know, a couple of things, right? Ideally, we will work with companies before they have an issue to uh, proactively uh, uh, test, examine their systems, uh, see how their security is set up, and see what they can do to make things better, right? Because, you know, uh, prevention is, is the best uh, medicine, as they say. So we can come in and do all the pro- proactive assessment work, testing, security uh, review, penetration testing, vulnerability assessments, all that type of stuff, um, and, 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 and help you hopefully know what you need to do to protect yourself. And then we can also help you implement the technology as needed to protect yourself. Um, and then if it's too late <laughs> and, and you're, you've been attacked and you're undergoing a ransomware attack or a data breach, something like that, you know, uh, my team, uh, that's one of the areas I've been, I've been doing, for, I've been working on for, tw- I've been focusing on for 20 years, which is all the incident response. So, so I will have a team that I can basically uh, respond to and, and have a team on site anywhere in the country, probably, you know, within a day's time, next day, so to speak. Um, and we can help companies through ransomware. Uh, I'll, I'll help them assess the issue, assess the damage, assess what's going on, uh, what to do, you know, how to recover from it. I can work. Uh, I can help companies work through it from the technology perspective. Uh, we do the forensics to understand uh, what the, what the threat actors have done. I can help them negotiate the ransom and effectuate payment. Um, and then, you know, afterwards, after the business is back up and running, you know, I can help them work through all the data breach notification and all the legal issues uh, with their with their attorneys, their uh, uh, privacy attorneys. I can help them uh, work through all those issues that come along with a ransomware attack. Because unfortunately, you know, a ransomware attack isn't just the business interruption aspect of things. That's the most obvious and, 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 and uh, pressing one. Uh, but once you get back up and running, uh, most businesses have months, months worth of cleanup and other things that they need to do as a result of a data breach attack. Yeah, I think what people kind of forget about too, because you know, they may have you already to, to work on there. They're like, oh, I got a, I got a place, you know, I got a place helping me. But th- what they forget to do in terms of due diligence, when they're acquiring a company or selling a company, they forget that, that whole aspect of it. It just completely flies by the wayside and they don't understand the, the dangers that may happen when acquiring a company. So that's something also that you guys do is the due diligence front end part to kind of see what they're buying, right? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I like to use the analogy of, of, of when you're buying a home. When you buy a home, you, you get a home inspection to find out what the, what the inherent risks are. Hey, there's radon. Hey, there's a leak in the foundation. You know, whatever the problems are. And you want to know what it is. And, and if, it's, if it's noteworthy, you go back to the seller and you ask for either A, kill the deal, or you adjust the price uh, to reflect that uh, risk that you're taking on when you buy the house. Buying a business is no different, and cyber risk is no different than you know a hole in the foundation, right? I mean, it's a risk, it's a problem, it's going to cost you money down the road, um, and you need to understand that walking in. And and you know that was no nowhere. I mean, no. The most obvious example of that is when Verizon purchased Yahoo, right? They, Verizon purchased Yahoo only to find out, you know. Uh, uh, they, they made an offer <laughs> for for Yahoo, and uh, between the time the offer was made and you know the time the deal was closed, you know about six months or so, uh, that's when it came out that there were all these data breaches. Um, and then as it turns out, I think uh, Verizon you know knocked a billion dollars off of that purchase price of Yahoo, you know as as a result. Um, you know it's it's roughly that that much money that they were able to knock off, and, and rightfully so. I mean, yeah, you know, Yahoo had some major data breaches or, and, and, and issues at the time. Um, but, you know, that's what happened. So, so again, if you're going to buy a business, um, doing the, as part of the due diligence, you know, just not only making sure the financials are, are, are good, you, you want to make sure all the other things are good too, including cybersecurity. I completely agree. David, thanks for coming on to us. Have you back again soon. Yep. Sounds good, Jason. Thank you so much.